morning, good evening to the people who are coming and joining us on this PMI UA chapter webinar series. So welcome everybody. And then we are very warm welcome to all of you uh, who are our regular audience in this webinar series and the people who are joining might be first time. Seeing the people are coming in and good. So we are building up the momentum there. We will give some time for the people to come in. I can see uh, here about 68 participants. Woo, so that's really good number. Good evening, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us in PMI chapter series here for webinar topic today with our esteemed speaker. Looking forward for an engaging webinar session. Formally launch ourselves in this webinar by 7.05. Just give a couple of minutes to our friends and colleagues to join us together. A good number of participants coming in, I'm seeing. Thanks all for joining us on time. Wow, we have a people from Pittsburgh as well. Global audience. Morning and good evening, good evening, greetings. Good, good. 87 audience, very, very nice number today. People are picking up the momentum slowly because I think we are at the right time of the year now, we're after the Ramadan period. And we are uh, really pleased to inform that these will continue and we will try our level best to bring all the best of the speakers and the topics, what we are trying to collect from you as well as a voluntary feedback, what you want to listen about, what you want to talk about, what you want to discuss about. Uh, I think we are very pleased to really get somebody of the interest for everyone. So from Tunisia, hello, good evening. Good evening, Allah. Just two more minutes and then we will officially launch ourselves with our topic of the webinar. So today, uh, our topic of the webinar, of course, you must be knowing already, uh, is through establishing and strengthening the PMOs. So all those PMOs who have been around the business must be very delighted today because now we are talking about you. Finally, okay. So we have been talking about a lot of stuffs in the previous webinars, like the technology stuffs, AI stuffs, or could be the agile stuffs. But yeah, I think here we have our esteemed speaker today, Grant Every, with me, uh, and definitely we are looking forward to hear from his own side of the perception and experience with all of us together. Oh, ninety-seven. I think we are going to make a century very well. I think seven of four, and we reach the century before seven of five, guys. That's milestone, I would say, if we achieve it. It's one more minute, 99. Okay, here you go. Wow, we get it. We get it before seven of five, more than 100. Wow, really a milestone. I think since I'm hosting the webinars around it, Grant, then I think this is one of the milestones. I've not seen 100 people joining in less than five minutes here. And what a global audience. Wow. Qatar, Doha, Oman, Tunisia, Pittsburgh, Abu Dhabi, of course. Lovely, lovely. I think we are good. We are good, guys. We are more than 100. So let me begin officially, guys. Uh, again, a warm welcome to all of you to this PMI UAE chapter webinar series, guys. My name is Anchal, uh, and I am the host and moderator for today's webinar for all of you. Uh, and I am going to be joined by our esteemed speaker, Mr. Grant Everett who is world's leading PMO maturity consultant and also author of a book, which is P3M3 Maturity Model. So I'm going to speak more about him in a detail, but before that, uh, I'm being joined with my team at the back end, Olimud and Bhavin and Amir as well now. So thanks for all making this possible for with us. Uh, we are going to have some housekeeping notes, friends, 
as usual. So please expect this webinar uh, to last somewhere around an hour and 15 minutes maximum. Uh, we will launch the topic with a set agenda tonight. Uh, we will go through a brief introduction of our speaker, Mr. Grant. And also I'm going to tell you about PMI UAE chapter and uh, where after that we will take it to the webinar topic and then there'll be a Q&A section as well, where of definitely we are trying to answer all the questions from all of you and the grant will do the level best to answer them up. Uh, definitely we encourage all of you to post your thoughts in the chat to make it much more interactive. And as well, if any of the questions you want me to put through grant, I really encourage all of you and request you to put them in the Q&A section of the webinars control. So I think we are good, we are good to go. And uh, let's begin with PMI UA chapter introduction first so that it can give you a brief idea from where we come from, what we're trying to do. And then thereover, we will go to the topic of the webinar. So allow me to share my screen. So that I can bring it up. Second. Oh. Here you go. Good. So as I speak that uh, we are doing this webinar as a part of UAE chapter of PMI. Uh, we are the world leader on and we work on behalf of project management profession worldwide and to advance this project management as, a, as an approach, as a mindset. Uh, as a chapter perspective, we are really particularly proud that we are on the top five chapters around the globe in terms of number of members. Also, we are doing day by day as we speak. And then this all chapter is run by volunteers, 100%, of course. And we are passionate to create this environment of project management as a profession, and also to really encourage people to do the personal development around it with the networking and education. We, as we all dependent on you as well, as an audience to make our chapter activities as much interactive and invigorating as possible. Please request you to humbly contribute to you through your activities by interesting talks, presentation, questions, and if any corporate sponsorship you would like to engage the chapter with. Uh, and also you can help us as a volunteer as well if you are interested around there. This is our chapter board members. Uh, I think this is the old one, but uh, I think we have our latest member slides, which I, I'm sorry, but this is not the latest one, but we have recently got the new member board slides. Uh, which will be uh, definitely be well. In terms of the benefits of 2023, uh, I would like to inform you that uh, chapter definitely works on the four pillars, networking, uh, learning and knowledge sharing, career growth and events part. And this particular series, what we are going through today is the part of diversified webinar section, which we do under the events team there. But we have other silver partners like the mm -hmm. web property and other collaboration partners over the screen. In terms of PDUs, uh, we would definitely uh, love to inform you that every webinar like this is giving you two strategic PDUs. And of course, it will be automatically will be credited to your PMI account within the four weeks, of course. So don't need to claim yourself. You don't need to do any action around it. Uh, please engage with the panelists through Q&A. And if you have any question regarding the PDUs by any chance, please drop an email to info at pmiua.org. Want to learn more about our chapter? Uh, we are there, pmiua.org website, as well as on the social media platforms in terms of Facebook and LinkedIn as well. And also, also please subscribe to our YouTube channel, definitely. You will get a lot of uh, these webinars published there, what we record there and always share with our audience. So uh, apparently this is uh, the small introduction what we have gone through there. Uh, before I go back to our speaker, uh, I would like to introduce him. So Mr. Grant, Mr. Grant is an international consultant, author and speaker as well uh, on EPMO maturity and reduction of risk in large and complex projects. Uh, in the 2012 grant established a consulting practice specializing in P3M maturity assessments uh, as well as he did the capability buildings and the provision of independent assurance reviews for the projects and different portfolios. Uh, before establishing outcome, 
uh, Insights, what was the company which he's working for. He was the director of the project advisory for KPMG New Zealand as well. In 2013, uh, he came to the space of authorization. So he co-authored the revision of P3M3 and then portfolio program and project management. This three maturity model is now widespread in use overall, as we all know. Uh, Grant is also an author, an award-winning book he wrote for reducing the risk and high-risk project called Project Management, Denial, and Death Zone. And his book was also the book of the month in March 2016. So Grant has been certified with PMP, and then he's done an MBA uh, from Victoria University of Wellington. So definitely, uh, there will be a lot of information, which definitely you would like to share with all of us, and some good nuggets you will carry over from this session. Over to you, Mr. Grant, looking forward to your session and topic. Here you go. Super. Thank you very much, uh, Anshal, for uh, that very kind, uh, very effective, efficient um, introduction. So uh, good morning, everybody uh, from um, sunny New Zealand, uh, which is where I'm speaking from at the moment. I tend to get around the globe uh, a little bit, but today I'm home, uh, my hometown in Wellington, uh, New Zealand. Um, so let me just dive straight into it. So hopefully everybody can see the opening screen uh, at the moment. We're, sh we're sharing effectively, Anshal, it's all good? Mm. You know, we still want to see your screen, Grant. You can share okay. it back. Please. Okay, let me, uh, yeah, let's see if we can get that going. Great, okay. Yep, you are there. We have, we have liftoff, excellent, excellent. Okay, so um, we all know why we are uh, here. So, let me just try and, uh, there we go. So we've had a bit of an introduction. So um, key points on the slide is, yeah, I'm the author of um, what was the PMI uh, book of the month, international book of the month for March, 2016, project management, denial and the death zone. Um, a book that looks at the comparison of risk behaviors between IT and business projects and high altitude climbing. So if you like stories of death and destruction, uh, or if you think your IT project is in that space, this is definitely a read for, uh, for you. Uh, I'm also co-author, so one of the authors um, for the British government of the P3M3 uh, maturity, uh, uh, P3M3 maturity model developed by um, the British uh, Treasury Office of Government Commerce. That stands for Portfolios, Programs and Projects Management Maturity model. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty terrible acronym. So uh, just to give you some context, um, so I, I'm based and raised in uh, New Zealand, population 5 million people here. It's about the same population as Dubai and Abu Dhabi combined. Um, our Prime Minister until January this year uh, was Jacinda Ardern, very popular Prime Minister in our country and internationally uh, for her work as well. Um, the current uh, New Zealand government five-year infrastructure budget is 71 billion New Zealand dollars. That's around um, 160 uh, billion um, AED, UAE dollars, uh, just to give you some idea of the small scale of our country. <clears throat> In New Zealand, innovative and agile adoption of PM process is a big thing. We're a small country, a little bit like UAE. We can't afford to reinvent um, every practice. We search the world for the best uh, practices to, to use. Um, the PMI uh, series of standards features very strongly in our country, as does the British Treasury Commission practices, such as um, PRINCE2, MSP, uh, management of portfolios, and the P3M3 maturity model. Also, the Better Business Cases, uh, BBC, it's a confusing acronym, but it stands for Better Business Cases. Uh, that is a very strong practice uh, used in New Zealand as well. So we are down here on this map at the bottom um, of the world. Uh, we're famous for our sheep, our kiwi fruit, um, our skiing and scenery for the Lord of the Rings movie. Um, for uh, our international business hub, uh, this is our capital city, Wellington, New Zealand. This is where um, I live. Uh, we're famous for our small satellites uh, space uh, program as well. Um, and for me, this is me with my family. I'm married to uh, Melanie 
And I have uh, my son, Tim, Timothy, and my uh, daughter, Charlotte. So a very um, big part of uh, my life. So there we go. So the objectives, objectives of the presentation are to give um, advice, tips, and tricks for the creation and strengthening of PMOs. It's not a presentation about PMO methodologies um, or manuals. There's an awful lot of um, experience and um, scars and loss of hair um, in this presentation. Uh, I've performed perhaps over 100 um, project management um, office capability and maturity assessments at multiple levels, portfolio program um, and project uh, in, my, in my career. So I've seen a lot of what goes on. So what is um, a PMO? We tend to call it project management office, actually, but there are many acronyms that work for, um, for PMO. I actually recommend to many executives or to many people establishing new, new PMOs, maybe don't use even the acronym um, uh, PMO because so many executives uh, and senior leaders have had bad experiences from excessively bureaucratic PMO acronyms and they can have allergic reactions. The PMO officially is described uh, in the PMBOK and in the British Treasury OGC manual uh, P3O in very similar forms. So the PMBOK describes it as a management structure that standardizes project related governance processes and facilitates the sharing of resources, tools, methodologies, and uh, techniques. So they're actually using project to define PMO. Um, the British Treasury OGC define it as the decision enabling and support business model for all business change within an organization. I really like uh, that definition um, uh, myself. And there's some of the other acronyms that we see um, used um, where we people refer to PMO. Uh, so very recently, March, uh, March of this year, um, PMI and PWC got together and produced this publication, which I recommend everybody um, have a read of if you haven't already seen it. Um, they called it the um, XMO, um, X meaning there are many letters um, that can precede the MO, acronym of PMO, focusing on value delivery. And they've tried to emphasize in this publication um, that successful PMOs um, are distinguished by their flexibility, their supportive mindset, and their strategic acumen. Um, and certainly I would maintain that the probably the only strategic EPMOs that I've seen which are successful are the ones that do focus on exactly these things. Actually, for the last 10 years, um, EPMOs have been needing to be just as tight if they are going to survive. Um, the work by PMI and PWC also referenced the importance of servant leadership. Servant leadership is an academic theory of uh, leadership, been around uh, since the late 1990s, just like transformational leadership, transactional leadership, authentic leadership. Servant leadership is where you place the, um, the needs um, and the performance and the support of your team ahead of uh, yourself, and you act as a steward for the organization. It's defined by empathy and collaboration, and it builds um, significant performance in high-risk context. So if, you, if you're not aware of servant leadership, um, it's a body of leadership theory, which I encourage strongly people to have a look at. The return on investment of P3M uh, maturity, the maturity of any um, PMO uh, practice, whether it's portfolios, programs, or projects management, that's the P3M acronym, um, uh, the return is very high. Organizations that under, undervalue project management as a strategic competency for driving change report an average of 67% more of their projects failing um, outright. Uh, that same uh, report by PMI, Pulse of the Profession Report, also gave these usual statistics, which we see um, a lot of. Only 56% um, of projects um, globally met their goals and original intent. Only 46% 46, 46 fell um, and delivered within budget, on time, et cetera. You can see those stats, not very impressive. That's, that's the average organization. So there's a lot of opportunity to do better. <clears throat> and if we do better, there's a lot of opportunity to save money uh, and risk um, and uh, stakeholder support uh, in our projects when, when we get it right. High maturity organizations typically do 40% to 50% better on all of these criteria um, with that greater uh, maturity. 
Greater maturity doesn't mean more processes. That's the beginner's mistake about trying to strengthen um, maturity. But I'll talk about that a little bit more shortly. Uh, another slide um, also found from the 2020 Pulse of Profession report. Pulse data shows in, that when it comes to value delivery, organizations that are high, highly mature in their capabilities outperform those that aren't across those key metrics that I just showed. Um, PMI is a high return, but high risk if you get it wrong. The average life uh, span of a PMO is around 12 to 24 months. Um, that's because people don't do them uh, very well in many organizations. They're often excessively um, process uh, focused. So, and if you fail with the establishment of a new PMO or fail restructuring uh, or strengthening your PMO, you often don't get another go. It'll probably be five <clears throat> or more years before somebody is invited back to have another attempt at strengthening or creating a new PMO. So important points about creating a new PMO or strengthening or restructuring a PMO. It's, um, it's critical that you define the business problem that you want the PMO to solve. It's critical that you define the benefit KPIs that solving those problems are going to provide in measurable um, metrics so that you can be held to account for those. And it's very important that you do a business case. If you're creating a new PMO, it's a high return investment uh, and you will need money and resources and support to complete it. And you need to justify that bid for funds. And the correct vehicle for that is a business case. We've got to walk our own talk when it comes to projects and PMO, new PMOs being projects. And we must establish governance um, for uh, PMO building projects, an accountable sponsor, steering committee, project manager, um, et cetera. Building or strengthening PMOs don't go well when they're done as a business as usual stream. Um, when they're done as business as usual and not as a project, not walking our own talk, um, what happens is they just slip to the bottom of the list when we try to um, uh, focus our resources on the work of developing the new practices and the new capabilities. Uh, it doesn't get the attention. There are always plenty of other fires to fight in the organization um, ahead of building a PMO as a business as usual work stream. So don't do that, um, create a project. As part of that project establishment, um, we recommend investment logic mapping. Reves investment logic ma mapping is a very simple <clears throat> one stage, two hour workshop process, which creates um, in a map, the three or so business problems that the PMO is needing to um, be created to solve. Uh, often executives don't know what those problems are. Often executives will have a sense that they want something called a PMO. They've heard that PMOs are good. Um, they've heard from uh, colleagues and other businesses that, um, that PMOs are useful things. So they tell somebody, build me a PMO. Um, uh, that's not a good start <clears throat> if the problems are not defined because there are so many different problems that a PMO can be uh, scoped to solve. Um, there's a, so in these two-hour workshops, you've got to have the right stakeholders present to draw out the business problems and the benefits and the recommended solutions, which will be, be part of the new PMO build. Where should a PMO be located? This is a, a relatively common question. Um, often um, a, a PMO, often PMOs are born um, uh, initially within IT groups um, traditionally because there's a lot of complexity and risk in IT enabled uh, business change projects. Um, and then often other executives and business groups will see the value that PMOs are providing uh, those complex business areas <clears throat> and want to have some of that in their area. Um, so the actual location of the PMO is not as important as the supporting manager who oversees the PMO. If it's a street strategic EPMO, we recommend that it report uh, to the chief executive um, officer who should chair the organization's portfolio investment committee. There's nothing more important actually in an organization for a chief executive officer to do than to oversee the delivery of strategy. Um, and the delivery of all of the organization's um, uh, investment and capabilities and change. Um, EPMOs 
um, can work reporting to a tier two manager um, uh, that's the next level down from the chief executive officer, as long as the um, CEO um, is a supporter. Practice PMOs, which are not enterprise uh, EPMOs, practice PMOs, which are not strategic, and there are many of those um, around, can work at a tier three, the next level down, again, quite happily. But again, they need to have a strong champion um, at the executive level somewhere, um, supporting and speak <clears throat> speaking up for them. And then finally, delivery PMOs that are, de that are delivering specific programs or large complex projects, or are, or are delivering work stream um, related uh, projects. Uh, they can work anywhere, um, but should be in within the business group that is sponsoring the particular program or project initiatives. So there's another um, finding here on the importance of maturity. This is from the Pulse of the Profession uh, 2023. This is this year, um, which found um, benefits realization management maturity, organizational agility and project management maturity emerged as top drivers of project success. So when we measure PMO maturity, we're often referring to the maturity of um, project and or program and or portfolio um, capabilities. We're often referring to the ma maturity of a set of organizational capabilities, not uh, always, uh, often not at all, the maturity of just um, a structure such as um, a PMO. Because often the capabilities of P3M um, exist um, in co uh, functionality with the PMO in other groups. Um, so the PMO may not hold all of the P3M practice capabilities. The average project we all know in this business, if you haven't seen the statistics, <clears throat> Um, have a quick search through the multiple studies and multiple sources. Um, the average project wastes about 30%. Right? That's conservative. Uh, the average project runs um, over its budget 60% <clears throat> of the time. But real waste is probably around 30% um, globally, um, unless you're above average. So look at your colleagues and other organizations. Do you think you're above average? Um, the global average of maturity is 1.5 out of 5 where zero is low and five is high um, on the international P3, M3 maturity model scale. So that's a pretty um, sad indictment on the maturity of org organizational um, practice um, uh, change capabilities globally. So it's 1.5. So, and if you're 1.5 or thereabouts, which most organizations are, it's the average, uh, many are below that. Um, then that, the waste in those organizations will be significant. So you don't want to be average. The choice of the maturity tool that you might use to assess your maturity um, is not as important um, as actually creating a maturity baseline using something, um, setting improvement goals, and then monitoring progress towards those goals. That's what's important. Uh, we, we'll show you a little bit about the um, OGC P3M3 model um, shortly. These are the actual um, international results of a large database of uh, P3M3 maturity studies that are done. Um, that spider diagram only goes out to 2.5 uh, for those who can uh, read that on their screens. Uh, the maturity model actually assesses to, to level five, but we don't show that because the average organization doesn't get anywhere near uh, level five. What we can see here are um, three, three maps for project management maturity, program maturity, and portfolio management maturity. Portfolio management um, is one of the least mature areas. Um, if you've got only got, say, $10 to spend, where should you spend your next $10? Portfolio management is actually the highest return area. Um, people tend to focus on the deliverables they can see in front of them. So that's why project management gets more attention. And from the slide, that we, we can see that management of resources is one of the lowest scoring areas, as is management of benefits, one of the lowest sc scoring capabilities in organizations. Um, resource management tends to be uh, the squeaky wheel gets the attention, or we call it a decibel-based prioritization. Who speaks the loudest gets the resources, and it's firefighting, and it's a very in inefficient way um, to manage um, projects. <clears throat> So P3M3 is actually three models in, in one. Um, P3M3 can assess 
all three models or just one of, of the three. Most commonly, uh, probably 80% of reviews are project management um, and maybe 20% are portfolio management. Um, and there are seven practice areas that P3M3 scores in. P3M3 is a very detailed maturity model. It looks at management control, benefits management, finance management, stakeholder management, risk management, organizational governance, and resources management. In another initiative, a collaboration between PWC and PMI, uh, they've created this uh, report, February 2022, which I also recommend um, uh, people have a look at. Um, the global, they call it a global PMO maturity index, <clears throat> where they looked at maturity um, uh, aspects, creating their own index for project management offices as a structure. And the top 10% um, in maturity of those in those organizations in that study um, did these things. They made sure the PMO had a seat at the at the senior level table, um, that investments, meaning projects, were aligned to organizational strategy. Um, they flexed to the organization's needs. That's a real big one. Uh, talent was a priority, and they embraced the use of technology. Um, this is just a quick skim through. I'm not going to go through these in detail. Uh, there's a few slides um, that I wanted to speak a little bit more about. But these are some of the attribute areas that maturity models often look at. These are from P3M3, um, project assurance, behaviors, information and knowledge management, infrastructure and tools. Organization, that's about companies, uh, competencies definition and um, training for projects and training for business executives as well, it's often overlooked. Sometimes we don't call it um, training for business executives. So they don't think they need training, uh, many business executives. So we tend to call these things masterclasses and then more of them turn up. Planning, pro processes, standards, um, and techniques. Um, these things all need to be defined as a practice, not as a bunch of processes. There are processes in all these areas, but as a practice, a practice is, is much larger than just processes. Um, a couple of popular maturity myths, um, um, people say good results are not possible without structured maturity. Actually, good results are possible, but it's not an organizational capability. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, good results are possible because of the heroic efforts of good people. Um, and hero heroism is actually a, a defined project management term. People can research that in their own time as well. In the modern world of complex and high risk projects, we find we need both. And there are some um, pulse of the profession reports that point to this, that success in challenging change initiatives occurs when we have heroic um, people who make uh, good things happen regardless of the constraints and problems um, and um, mature practice. When those things occur together, you get the best outcomes. Project management maturity must precede portfolio management maturity. That's not correct. That's old thinking quite a few years ago. These days, we actually encourage portfolio management um, program and project management maturity in parallel because you get returns at all three of those levels. And the last myth uh, that you must staircase maturity development. You must be level one first before you can be level two or level three. And, and that's not correct either. We actually encourage organizations to take uh, the maturity attributes from each level which uh, meet their needs um, that the business has asked them to solve. For, to solve. for example, uh, level four maturity contains a lot of quantitative uh, performance management of practice <clears throat> attributes, and that's performance management that um, all of us have in our job um, performance agreements and in our group, um, our group or business unit. Uh, performance agreements, and we also should have it for project maturity at all levels. PMO failure factors. Here is a um, quick self-assessment that I recommend people who work in PMOs do. These are um, six factors uh, found in the literature and which I see all the time um, where PMOs have failed, where they have been disestablished and perceived as an overhead and cut by the organization. Um, so which, how many of these are present in your organization? If you have one, um, one of these, you might be okay. If you have two or more, 
then your PMO might not be around in a year's time. Just something to have a think about. Business problems um, weren't defined. The PMO has nil or low project management expertise in its team. The PMO is perceived as being too controlling or too process focused. That's a real big one, big mistake. The PMO does not have an executive champion at a senior level. You're going to need a champion. When the senior leaders are sitting around the leadership table looking for things to chop to save money, uh, and you don't have a champion at that table, <clears throat> your PMO um, might not be there too much longer. The PMO does not continuously demonstrate the business value it is providing. A PMO, there's some good literature research on this, a PMO cannot sit on its laurels, cannot do a great job in its first or second year and then sit back and think that it will still be supported one or two years later. Every year, a PMO must demonstrate to senior executives the business value that it is providing. And the strengthening of the last one, the strengthening of the PMO has not been treated as a project. It has no business case, no funding, no sponsor, et cetera. As I said before, if you don't treat it as a project, you won't get that leadership support and focus that, that it needs. Uh, this was, yeah, the Beyond Agility Pulse of the Profession report in 2021 showed the importance of what they call gymnastic enterprises. PMOs need to be flexible and listening to their stakeholders. Capability balance is very important with um, PMO building. Uh, your processes, tools, people, and information, and culture um, all need to be addressed equally. The common mistakes people make, which cause things to be out of balance, is that they rush to buy a sexy new PPM tool for reporting or for uh, risk identification or for um, a centralized data presentation format. Um, please do not rush to buy a new PPM tool until your PMO's processes have been defined and accepted and have been running for at least a year because you won't know what you want your PPM tool to do otherwise. Overinvestment in uh, process mapping, um, big piles of processes and templates get created, yet other areas are neglected. Um, Overinvestment in certification courses for project managers uh, and other people associated with P3M uh, change, change management. Um, we don't recommend as much sending the people on certified courses as what we used to. They're expensive and they're time consuming. They have their place, but they, they must be used sparingly. For maturity of capabilities in an organization, we encourage uh, two-hour uh, training units on specific topics, much, e much more um, easily accepted and used without being too demanding um, on people and um, not nearly as expensive. Excessive reporting, absence of sea leadership support. So here's a couple more tips on maintaining cap capability balance. Um, go slow. Strengthening PMO maturity takes it takes 24 months to strengthen from one level of the zero to five level uh, maturity scale. That's because it's a change management exercise. It's a, it's a business culture change exercise. A pile of templates and a pile of processes does not a new PMO uh, make. So I often see people setting their uh, maturity targets uh, way too ambitiously. Um, and then it ends in tears because the executives are disappointed that they didn't have everything. And nobody told the executives this was going to be an important change management exercise. Focus on building stakeholder engagement, not processes and tools. Your stakeholders and focusing on them and their needs is the, is the biggest and most important thing that somebody can do when building a new PMO. Um, set the thresholds for writing certain standards of business case and set the thresholds for doing certain levels of assurance review, re review very high when you're uh, creating new practices, um, new templates and new assurance um, review types. Um, uh, if, if you set them too low, it's very difficult to come back and shift them up later on. And if you set them too low, people will protest. What you really want is to set them high and have other people in other parts of the organization saying, hey, we would like some of that too. Uh, at, what we say is you, you want to get all the fish onto the hooks first. Um, you don't want to start pulling the lines in 
of buy-in uh, too soon. And importantly, define what isn't a project in your organization. These are um, some examples. These numbers could vary widely depending on your organization. But what is the threshold at which something is just minor works and is not um, a project? The key question to ask here is, will a piece of work benefit by being put through a process of complying um, with directions on um, standards of project management? Major procurements in the organization which use repeated processes, repeated procurements, for example, uh, buses for um, uh, transport companies uh, cost a lot of money, but they are often a procurement which doesn't benefit from being managed as a project. Um, uh, equipment purchases, smaller equipment purchases can sometimes not be classed as projects, but you need to be careful here. I've um, seen many cases, particularly in complex industries. Um, the health, health sector is an example. MRI scanning uh, machines, people will say to me, oh, but we buy these MRI things all the time. Why do we need to treat this as a project? Well, actually, an, an MRI scanner, it's an expensive piece of equipment, but also they have to go into specially designed and specially built rooms. They, they need specially um, trained uh, people to support them. Um, there's a return on investment that has to be approved from them. So that's an example of equipment that should be treated as a uh, project. And importantly, don't let the profile of your PMO become too high. Uh, I've seen some successful PMOs who have done very well um, start to almost show off. Um, you'll quickly become a target for cost-cutting rounds if you show off. Always be humble. Always be humble with your the successes of your PMO. And the same way should all, we should always be humble in our own personal or professional successes. This is the standard uh, business case and life cycle stage, um, life cycle used in many governments actually around the world. Sometimes these stages are called different things. But assurance at each life cycle stage point is a very key uh, high return thing um, for uh, value return on investment of, of P3M organizations. Post implementation reviews at the end of delivery of a project not at closure but at six months or 12 months or two years or five years or 20 years depending on the type of project um, are very important to be able to show your executives that these things have delivered um, delivered value i won't go into the detail of that slide but people are welcome to um, look at that um, once it's been circulated um, why assurance is needed and is important at each life cycle stage because at each life cycle stage um, senior executives, the steering committee, the leadership team have to make a decision. Do they let the project pass through the gate to the next stage? Do they approve the business case? Do they approve going to market, going to tender? Do they approve contract signature? Do they approve go live, for example? Um, these are decisions that all projects need to make at those key points. And chief executives um, and executive steering committees. Um, team members don't have the confidence unless they get an independent report. There are lots of things that are constantly battling optimism bias, strategic misrepresentation. That's where people exaggerate the importance of a project to get limited funding ahead of other projects, high complexity, low maturity, and in particular, the commercial self-interest of vendors um, and the career self-interests of, uh, of managers and sunk ego. Sunk ego is way more damaging than sunk cost as a factor to be, as a risk to be aware of in projects. There's just a couple of points here uh, about what a, uh, an integrated quality assurance framework <clears throat> should look like in, the, in an organization, um, independent quality assurance. Project managers and project sponsors um, cannot do their own IQA. They are too conflicted. Uh, it must be done. Uh, it must be appointed. Um, it must be contracted, for example, by the EPMO or PMO or by an internal audit group or somebody else independent. Um, there's way too much bias if project managers do their own health checks. Uh, trust me, and I'm sure you will have seen that. With the best of intentions, um, their optimism um, can create risk. <clears throat> Stakeholder management, I commented on this just before, is very, very important. So what is a stakeholder? A stakeholder is anyone 
who can influence the purchase or use decision of a service. It applies to projects and it applies to your new PMO as well. The greater a stakeholder's ability to influence service use, what they say about your PMO, for example, the more important that stakeholder, which is why we do stakeholder analysis and stakeholder uh, mapping. So during the build, PMO build and PMO operations, stakeholder expectations and perceptions must be uh, managed. <clears throat> a stakeholder reference group, I always recommend as part of a new PMO building. You want to consult with your stakeholders on what the practices are going to be, what the requirements are going to be for processes, what the requirements are going to be for levels of template to be completed. You want to get their buy-in. Uh, an example of uh, how important stakeholders are is this formula that PMO effectiveness equals um, your framework or processes coverage times your stakeholder, the percent of stakeholder engagement. If you've, if you've built 80% of your new framework, but you only have 20% of stakeholder uh, support, then your PMO is only 16% effective. So that's a very dramatic uh, numerical way of looking at the importance of stakeholder engagement. This is a, um, a really good uh, report. It's only just come out this month, um, actually, um, an academic paper uh, that presents a, mo um, a model that provides a more nuanced measurement of project performance, such as stakeholder satisfaction. Actually, aspects of stakeholder satisfaction is what this paper is all about, and I commend it to people. It talks about the importance of uh, personal empathy, problem orientation, leaning into the stakeholders' problems dealing with change, being resilient and doing that well with your stakeholders and professional uh, appeal. Um, is your PMO uh, perceived to be a professional organization? The way the people uh, operate and the look and feel of your material, these things matter. So we're down to just the last couple of slides now. These are project management office red flags to watch out for. Repeated cost, or schedule slippages in projects. If that's a pattern, a common thing, um, as we know, those of us who have done our PMP exams, 15% uh, of the way into a project, you can extrapolate um, cost overruns or schedule overruns or benefit under delivery to the finish line. Very difficult to turn those around. Uh, you've got to look at what's causing those. High numbers of issues, uh, that means that your risk management is not working. Lots of medium rated risks, but not but no high rated risks. Why is that? Uh, we see this in some organizations where the executives um, effectively um, punish or discourage by their questioning people to raise high risks. So people don't raise them because people are worried for their, their careers. So a lot of medium rated risks, but no high rated risks. I'm suspicious immediately when I see that. High numbers of high or high or moderate rated risks. So that means there could be a problem with the capabilities. Why are there so many risks? Um, or there could be a lot of optimism um, or risk appetite may be set too high. High project team turnover, that's always a problem in any part of an organization. Stakeholders are not supportive. If you have more than, say, 5% of your stakeholders in stakeholder value terms um, who aren't supporting you, you could have a serious issue. Stakeholders will eventually get your PMO shut down if they don't like what you're doing. Excessive optimism about high risk or struggling projects. I do a lot of project reviews, uh, reviews of projects which are in trouble. And I'll go in and people will tell me, well, it's not, it's not that bad. You know, we've, we've, we've got it solved. We've got it sussed. And I look and actually uh, the failures continue um, even when they know they've got issues. Watch out for optimism, excessive optimism. Projects aren't being resourced. So why can't the pro your projects receive support? Why aren't you getting uh, testing time or developer time? Why, why aren't you getting project manager allocation um, from the executive uh, leaders? And it may be because your project is just not a priority. Um, schedule sh slippage should be built into plans immediately if, if you, that's happening. Um, if there are lots of uh, close calls or near misses occurring with projects, um, then you should expect a big failure uh, to happen um, pretty soon, uh, like <clears throat> a black swan event. If your organization is used to doing projects of a certain size, cost-wise, say $10 million is the average typical project or $100 million, 
but you go up in scale by a factor of 10, that's a risk, an important risk factor uh, change for you. Um, it, it's a level of complexity that you're not used to, a level of cost that you're not used to, generally speaking. Absence of approved baseline documents for projects. There, there's got to be a schedule cost and scope and benefits baselines, four different baselines for any approved project. The number of projects I see that don't have these baseline documents um, where they're not clearly understood or they're scattered across a lot of information sources um, is a risk. Patterns of slippage in any of those is a real risk. Abs regular absence of project sponsors from governance meetings. And in your new PMO build, regular absence of the PMO, uh, the new PMO project sponsor from steering committee meetings for the new PMO. That's a red flag. Relationship issues, <clears throat> always a red flag. Low servant leadership behaviors. If people are dictator dictatorial, and transactional in their leadership styles, they won't get the best out of people. There's something called, uh, reasons of something called social pain. We tend to shut down in our, in our um, consciousness, um, in our heads, we will shut down the messages and, and our support for uh, leaders who um, are very transactional. Inexperience in key roles, um, project management, project sponsorship, senior supplier or vendor is a red flag. And any new type of project I mentioned before, scale of 10 cost-wise, greater than what you're used to doing, um, new technology, new functionality, uh, new complexity. These are all red flags and uh, need great care. Those projects fail or deliver poorly um, a lot of the time. And often those factors hunt together uh, in packs. Um, failure rates extraordinarily high when all those things come together. A, new tech, a project with new technology and new functionality and very big. Um, be afraid is what we say uh, about those. So I think we're getting pretty close to the end. We're right on track time-wise. Um, yep, here we go, the last stage, uh, last slide. Remember, um, uh, projects don't go wrong, they start wrong, which is why on that life cycle slide earlier, um, you saw actually four life cycle stages of a project before the build commences, four life cycle stages in a good life cycle, um, project life cycle, um, um, occur before um, the build decision is made. That's a good example of planning and getting everything in place um, before you push the go button. Uh, if you rush that front end, you're in, gonna be in trouble. Great, so I'll hand back to um, Anchal at this stage. Perfect, perfect. You are right on the spot there, Grant. So wonderful. <laughs> on time and covering end to end, establishing and strengthening PMOs. So uh, wonderful. I think there are a couple of questions coming up through as well. I will definitely table them up. We have some time as well. Before that, uh, I would like to just ask uh, one important question which came to my mind while going through your webinar. If you go back to the two slides back, the previous, yep, here you go. So you yep. explain the first point there in a, as a kind of example. Right, okay, so um, if you have a project which is running over budget at an early stage or is, or is running behind its uh, schedule plan, uh, then you need to watch out because you can point that out to people. You can point out that slippage to the project manager and you can point it out to the sponsor and they'll say, yeah, sure, we know that's happening. We're gonna fix it. Actually, most of the time they don't. They don't fix it because it's sort of like when you're in the high on the highway driving home from the office. the The traffic is really heavy and people are doing you know crazy things. Um, mm. the, it's very hard to intervene in projects. It's very hard to intervene. Um, you you have to be very strongly proactive to mm. solve the problems which are happening. Uh, and most often people don't. So it's a red flag. And if that's happening across a lot of projects. There's a practice issue. There's a maturity issue going on. Um, wow. And it's costing, it's costing you money. When it happens, it's costing you money. You will also be under delivering benefits, which is the big one. We don't talk about this enough, but that will also be happening. I can guarantee it when that's happening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Agant. I think we have a couple of questions. I would like to table them up. One is coming from Ida there. So what if the PMO is not having the seat at the C level? Okay. They have not got that seat. Mm. So if that you don't situation, have a seat, how we strengthen it. Yeah, sure. 
So you've got to find a champion. You've got to find um, somebody who does have a seat or somebody who is very close to somebody who has a seat. So you might not have one of the senior leadership uh, team as, a, as your champion at speaking for you at the table, but somebody who is uh, the next level down has the, has the ear of one of those senior leaders. You must have that. If you don't have somebody at the senior leadership table and you are a whole of organization PMO, if you are an enterprise PMO and you don't have that, um, you, you're probably struggling in a lot of other areas, I suspect, um, if, if you aren't being heard. You, you're, you're probably at risk. That's, often it's a risk factor. And if you've got a couple more, then you could be in trouble. What is the best advice, again, on the follow-up there, to engage a not, not very supportive stakeholders in a way where we are not, uh, we're not going into the hardship as well, but sub being supported and being, being interested in the PMO when you know that there's not enough support there, how do we engage them out? In our right, okay. So you've got to get your PMO, um, if you're building a new PMO, um, you've got to engage with them actively. You've got to listen to their what their needs are. Um, this is about defining the business problems. And if the senior leadership team has asked you to solve um, some certain business problems, then in your discussions with the stakeholders, uh, which you should, and you should be having discussions with them weekly um, through their involvement on your steering committee that, um, and through the stakeholders' involvement in, a, for example, a stakeholder advisory group, which is working in providing um, consultation into the PMO build team. So, um, yeah, so engagement, you've just, if you, if you don't have that support at the moment, you've got to get it. Okay, because it's going to uh, be something that finishes you off, probably, um, if senior stakeholders are not um, are not supported. I'll often find try and find out why. Often they don't see the reason for the bureaucracy of big business cases or the bureaucracy of of reporting. But usually there are enough failed projects around to point at those projects and say we need to solve why these projects are constantly running over budget and they're constantly late and and their business cases are being approved too, too quickly everybody knows the it system that they want to go by but what is the business problem first before you go buy the new it system or before you build the new road to a certain place what are the benefits and disbenefits that are going to um, happen so there so you so you've got to um, discuss with stakeholders and involve them in these conversations empathy and having sincere empathy and connection to your stakeholders um, find the people in your team who are not process policemen and send them out into the business groups. Um, I also, for big PMOs, I actually recommend, just as with IT support groups do this, um, have PMO people located in the business groups um, on the floors or in the buildings um, where people are doing the big scary projects or where the stakeholders are not supportive. Put them on site. So people can see them and they can give immediate help and support. Oh, wow. That's, I think that's a very valuable piece of advice, actually. That was, that really would work, in my opinion, because uh, on the ground, you literally learn the, the why questions so interactively and so in a faster feedback loop. So definitely that will help there. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. uh, another interesting question, which I have lined up here, is that around the, you spoke about standard methods. Uh, you spoke about benchmarking. So how do you really objectively measure stakeholder engagement? Is there any standard method about it? Um, stakeholder management is one of the seven perspective areas for um, P3M3 um, maturity model, for that maturity model. So we measure the maturity of stakeholder management. We used to call it stakeholder engagement, but yes. management is actually, is actually um, more than that. So we look yes. to see... Um, are, there, are there tools and techniques that the organization is using? Are projects doing um, stakeholder influence versus um, stakeholder importance types of maps? Is there analysis? Are projects doing uh, analysis of their stakeholders? Are they engaging themselves with um, stakeholders? Is there training available um, to project managers uh, about how to do that? Because many project managers will come in to your organization and they may not be very, be very good at doing um, uh, stakeholder relationship stuff. In the, in the first uh, forced life cycle stages of a project, 
especially big projects, um, not yet in delivery, stakeholder engagement is very important in those early stages. And that's, that's a different type of project manager um, and um, a different type of project manager than the project manager who's going to deliver something, who's going to deliver the new IT system or the new building or the new business group or the new change transformation. So uh, you, you've got to, we, we look for examples of where uh, project managers have the tools and techniques, um, have the guidance and have the training to support them. That's how we assess stakeholder management maturity. We, we, and of course, talk to the stakeholders because they are the best ju judge of whether that's effective. Good, good. Thank you so much. I think there is a, one more question uh, from Dheeraj is that, would it be instrumental to recruit an influential, experienced and technical person from the business to be your champion? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm a big fan of the, the, the British government treasury practice um, called uh, Managing Successful Programs. Um, the mm -hmm. acronym is um, MSP, Managing Successful Programs. MSP is to complex programs and change and complex projects as the same as Prince 2 is to yep. um, project delivery. So project MSP, I, I recommend to, to everybody, MSP places great influence on the business change executive role, partnering, uh, partnering horizontally with the project manager. So if you have a project manager for any project, but also for a new PMO build, we absolutely recommend that alongside the project manager is somebody from within the business who knows the business, who knows what the business wants. And uh, one of the big reasons for this is that, especially uh, in modern times today, um, project managers are professionals and they come not always from the business area and they don't always know the context of the business uh, change. And so that's um, imperative to have the business change. We call it a business change executive. There are many titles uh, working alongside. Yeah, so that's absolutely um, recommended. Thank you. Um, a tricky question. What's the best strategy when it comes to handle the aged management who is continue to reject the modern project management techniques, especially under the PMO umbrella? How would you handle this aging management uh, to, to, to get into that mode where they stop rejecting the new modern techniques or start embracing them in a different form? There's more of a kind of change management approach. But yeah, your, what, are your two, what are your two cents around that? I'm sort of slightly smiling. Like the easiest way is to have a quick restructure and uh, and bring in some fresh uh, fresh blood. Um, if that's not possible, and you know, and often it's at the senior leadership table where this problem could be yeah. originating. Um, I've got to be careful. I can't talk myself these days. But uh, the, the the challenge that you have got to do is to um, give them examples in their own organisation or in their own business groups where things are not going well, where projects are failing. And there is always things to be found that you can demonstrate. Um, and you've simply got to show them um, the evidence for uh, the capability issues that they're having. For example, um, you say for, there's no steering committee, so there are no conversations, or that a particular project manager is dictatorial, or um, that there is uh, no resources um, being able to be obtained. Or there are no there is no risk management happening in the, these projects, because uh, these modern techniques are really only the capture of old techniques. Actually, um, to speak to stakeholders, to document your uh, risks, to document the, the the good things, the benefits that you want to happen. Even the oldest uh, people on our boards um, understand that they want benefits. And when you say to them, "Hey, should we write down um, uh, metrics and time bound?" Uh, key performance indicators for these benefits so that we can prove the return on investment so that we can then um, um, uh, Im improve and um, advance the return on investment that helps their careers. Helping people's careers is always a good, uh, or suggesting you're going to, is always a good way to get support. So there we go, a couple of thoughts on that. Wonderful. So I'm the cautious about the time. I would just take the one last one from Wemby. Uh, what is your advice for the first month in joining a company to start and lead a PMO? Right. Okay. So for the first month, actually the first three months, uh, don't do anything dramatic. You, you've got to get in there and understand 
with what their problems are. So you've got to have lots of meetings um, with people. You're going to have to look at, um, uh, that's to build stakeholder support. Uh, you want to be speaking to the project managers. You want to be speaking especially to the project sponsors and the business owners. You want, probably when you get there, the new PMO manager probably is going to arrive and the problems, um, the purpose of the PMO is probably not going to be very well defined. What are the what are the business KPIs for the PMO group, actually? All PMO groups, like any business group, should have its own annual plan and its own um, performance management plan. So how do we know that the PMO has had a good year or a bad year? What are those KPIs? And if there are none, and there probably won't be, then create some. Um, so yeah, don't do anything quickly, definitely. Um, every business is different. Uh, PMI have done spent a lot of money on researching where success in PMOs occurs. And it occurs where the PMO, the design of the PMO and the operation of the PMO, where that meets exactly the needs of the organization. And those needs are different for every organization. Thank you so much. I think that was really, really astonishing and mind opening thoughts. And my key takeaways from today's webinar, we are definitely you spoke about why PMOs fail. Okay, that is very fundamental. You spoke about red flags. That was very much eye openers. And then of course that how the PMO journey in terms of the maturity model need to learn and then evolve the period of the time. Uh, in terms of the different metrics level, you spoke about 1.5 score. That was really another yes. aspect of uh, the facts and figure, which I think everybody would be definitely surprised to look at, for example, but yeah, that's the hard reality in the situations where the maturity model is tick ticking the staircase model, what you spoke. So definitely you you were really quite right in certain aspects and uh, thank you so much. I think your thoughts and your ideas what you presented today, I think the testimony to it is 161 participants, 165 participants were there today. Uh, right. Listen, and that's yeah, that's a, um, really good. That's a good, yeah. that's a good, good cricket score. True, true. So thank you so much, audience, for asking us those lovely questions. Uh, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, definitely, uh, I would not say goodbye uh, before thanking John and then the grant around it. And my team, uh, the marketing side, were responsible for posting all this relevant information on our different social media pages and on the website. Uh, we are going to close the web not today, but definitely I would like to thank the people from all other aspects of PMI UAE. Uh, of course, the volunteers behind the successful webinars like this from the outreach uh, and then finance and governance side as well. So uh, definitely we have another webinar lined up uh, next, which is on 8th of June. And the topic would be how project management will be reshaped using artificial intelligence. So again, a more of a mixture about the old practice of project management, which we've been living and, and of course experiencing it, but now with the AI model coming in, is it going to be any kind of impact and analogy around it, which can help the PMI practices. So until our next webinar together with my colleague behind the camera, Olimed Bhavin, uh, this is Anchal wishing you all of you a pleasant evening ahead. And thank you for all your participation and God bless to all of you. Take care, bye-bye. Thanks, Grant. Bye-bye.